Are you unable to concentrate on the tasks at hand? Do you need help focusing more or leveling up your game? Here's a tip. Try Cognizant Citicoline, clinically studied to support mental energy, focus, memory, and attention. Cognizant supports brain health and supplies the brain with the energy it needs to stay sharp. Cognizant is a leading nootropic featured in over 200 products. This podcast is powered by Cognizant. Visit Cognizant.com to learn more and find a product to help you fuel your day. Ready to achieve great heights? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Power Your Performance, the podcast where we dive deep with leaders in the gaming world and beyond and learn the techniques they use to power their lives. I am your host, Gary Kleinman. Power Your Performance, powered by Cognizant, welcomes the dynamic healthcare practitioners, the Chez family, Dr. Tom and Amy, and Dr. Amy and Tom. Welcome. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, Gary. Uh, Thank you for having us. It is, it is my pleasure because I, I know we're the things that we're going to talk about, which are fascinating, uh, not only, you know, the things that I'm interested in, but I know the audience and some of our other guests. So to get some background, um, I don't I don't get the wonderful opportunity to, to often speak with uh, a husband and wife uh, that are doing some of the same things together, which just sparks a whole different thing on different topics that we won't get into. So where did the, the health care come from? Did you meet in school? Did you meet before mm-hmm. school? What, one, and you guys, I'm just going to put the questions out there. You arm wrestle for who talks about it. I'll, I'll, I'll start as far as the health care side. Okay. If you don't Uh-oh. Mind. Um, I mean, for my healthcare journey started at, at four years old. Um, I started wearing glasses at four years old. Um, I literally wore the Forrest Gump braces walking to school. I, I say to myself every, every day, having a, a wife like Amy, like I was an absolute train wreck, a husky <laughs> kid. So I had everything going wrong for me and, and how I ended up with someone like Amy is beyond me. But that's where my healthcare journey began. And with having those issues, it was my optometrist in my life when at a young age, they would always say to me, because they knew kids were mean, they say, you know, how you doing, Tom? You know, I got big glasses like Harry Carey, got, you know, poles down your legs and you're walking to school. Wow. So they always took a keen interest in how I was doing and hence, you know, bullying and other types of things. And I said to myself, that is a really cool thing. And I think I want a part of that. And that's how my journey began as far as um, becoming an optometrist and leading to that. In the future. Well, I, well, that's fascinating because I, I had half a similar with my eyes. I, mean, I had those thick Coke bottle glasses growing up. And the only other person that had that, you might be old enough to remember, is Alan Funt doing What's My Line, right? I mean, they had these thick, <laughs> thick things that you can probably do arm curls with today. <laughs> and and the day that I had Lasix uh, many, many years later, it really was emotional from the standpoint of seeing a clock for the first time without, you know, any kind of aid was just like shocking. And I don't think I realized, and, and maybe you did or did not, the, the emotional toll it had on you. Forget your eyes and walking is just the fear of being bullied or people saying what they said and kids say what kids do. And it was so freeing, um, finally, just not to have to address that, which yeah. which is remarkable. All right, Amy, how'd you get into it? I, it the, something different, hopefully. <laughs> Yes, no, something it, it, something different. But it, my story is pretty funny as far as um, I, when I was in school and I was in college, high school, there were one thing I really wanted to do was I wanted to be a fighter pilot. That was my dream. I wanted to fly F-15 fighter jets and I was on my way. I had a um, letter of recommendation from the late Senator Hines. I grew up in Pennsylvania and I was going to go to the Air Force Academy and I went to uh, my physical And they said, oh, great, you're tall enough. Ah, but you aren't tall enough by one inch on your torso height. You will never fly. Oh, my gosh. And my dreams were just dashed. And so I said, okay, well, what are my other interests that I want to do? And I loved astronomy. I started out in astronomy astrophysics. And the one class I hated the most was telescopes, optics, math. It's like the devil. I absolutely hated it. (laughs) 
And then I became an optometrist where I use lenses and telescopes that every so day of my life in a different <laughs> application. It's like that is so the funny. universe's funny joke. Yeah, like the thing that you thought you detest the most is the so, thing that you've so applied when it, to but when people. did this switch you know that that switch flip and you say i'm going to be an optometrist i mean vision what is that so when i was um you know in college and i decided okay i don't want to be an astrophysicist you know i, I don't want to you know live like a bat and be in chile doing telescopes all night and, and not have a, a family it was actually a um one of the lead researchers for the Hubble telescope was one of my mentors and professors. And she oh. sat me down and, and she said, you know, what do you really want? What, what, what really drives you? She saw me taking Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops up to the observatory and teaching people about, uh, we had like a $50,000 telescope that I had access to at any time. And I love to teach and uh, share knowledge and be with people. And she's like, you're way too much of a people person to sit in a, in a lab. It's just not your jam. You know, what do you really want to do? And, and we sat down and I loved science and I wanted to work with people every day. And we kind of, you know, put our heads together. And she said, I, I think you should look into optometry. And so it was really her direction to say, why don't you look into something that's more medically oriented and, and do that? And, and that's that's what happened. Very cool. And then the two of you, did you meet in school? We met at a conference. So we oh, met okay. at a conference. She was, uh, I'm scared. If she, if he's going to tell this story, I'm scared, but go ahead. Tom. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, he's going to tell the story, but I'll give you editing rights. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. So, okay. Um, so I was in Southern California, uh, College of Optometry in Fullerton. She was at Ohio State. We met at a conference in San Antonio, which was the large American Optometric Association. I was a part of the, the National uh, Board and Student Association. She was there in her, in her final year getting business classes and other things, and I was in my, my third year. She was just about to graduate, and literally she was not there she was all business, as she says. You could tell this if you want, honey. So why don't you finish the act? <laughs> so I had um, land picked out outside of Columbus, and I had already met with the zoning board. I was going to put my practice right next to this little picket fence next to a Wendy's in New Albany, Ohio, and I was ready to go. And I was on a mission. I was there to get business advice. I was not there to meet anybody. And then I saw Tom. And I still remember there was a room of about 800 people. I, I still remember what he was wearing. He was way off in the distance, but time kind of stopped for a second. And then um, the next day, uh, a mutual friend introduced us. And I was speechless for the first time in my life because I'm Sicilian and I talk all the time. <laughs> I always have something to say. Uh, but I didn't know what it was. He turned around and it just kind of struck me for a second. And I made a little off comment to her. Her name was Carrie. And w when he turned back around, I said something like, oh, good ones are always taken. And she kind of took that as a, oh, you know, Amy must have found Tom interesting. <laughs> so she baited him and ran into him at dinner and said, Amy's going to be at this place tonight. And I didn't I didn't know that she had done this. And so when we were out on the dance floor and I was complaining that I had an eight o'clock class to go to because I was so focused on, you know, being business. Um, I will never forget. It was Prince the Kiss playing on the on the dance floor. And she grabbed my hand and said, Amy, I told Tom was he, that you were going to be here. He just walked in the door by himself. And I looked at her and I called her an expletive. And then I walked right over to Tom. And I don't think either one of us remember what exactly I said, but I beelined right up to him. Um, and the rest was it, history. Fantastic. My comment was stalker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was what I was afraid you were going to call me. But yeah. yes, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that the statute of limitations has expired. So I think you're both yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, that was 1999. That That is fantastic. So. When do you, did, you, did you decide you're going to work together in a practice as opposed to individual practices and separate it from home life, you know, home, well, home work life? On. Yeah, I mean, that was very early on. So, so basically, you know, quick story here was basically ending. I went home to my parents. She went home to her parents said, hey, I think I met, I think I met the one. And three months later, I was 
sitting there in a kitchen in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, meeting her parents for the first time on Labor Day, making homemade gnocchi, rolling the dough out and asked her dad, He's and good. Mom, can I marry your daughter? <laughs> And then that led to us getting married a year later. But we knew we wanted to practice together. I mean, our personalities just sort of feed off of one another. We love practicing together. We don't currently, um, but we knew from the from the start. So she had moved to Arizona. We found a home. I was finishing up my rotations in Indian Health Service and other places that I were across the country. And then we um, we bought a practice and started practicing together. And uh, the rest is kind of you know, history with some things along the way with kids and other things. So when you first, yeah, those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when you first started and, and we'll segue into esports and gaming, cause I know you have a, um, a very identifiable passion, uh, in that, but when you started practicing, was there a focus in terms of the practice or was it just a general optometric practice and whoever comes in, gets fitted and, and exams, or are you looking at pediatric and looking at some of the, the eye issues that kids have? What, what was your thinking at the time? And what, what did you do at that practice? So um, my time at Ohio State, I devoted quite a bit to um, vision therapy and sports. So what was really interesting for me was to um, – practice more focused on, you know, the patients who would come in trying to figure out what they would do in their everyday life. Are they a golfer? You know, do they play baseball? You know, are, I, I guess, you know, my focus in our, in our practice when we first came out was more specialty areas. So I would work with people who had very specific needs to see really crisp, really sharp, um, and find different ways and custom design, um, contact lenses and those types of things to give people that edge where traditional lenses and traditional contact lenses couldn't do it. So one of my um, passions was to figure out, you know, where the issue was, but then create a custom solution for someone. So that was just something coming out out of Ohio State. They're really big on uh, contact lenses and, and sports. So um, that was that was where my focus was. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting and, and and it certainly applies to gaming. I don't hear in the optometric or even the ophthalmic industry about vision sports per se, as opposed to yeah. vision. And is there a difference? I mean, are there different protocols that you look at? Uh, for sports vision to either increase hand-eye coordination, which is probably off the top of my head the, the single biggest issue that probably most athletes have. You know, certainly golfers, of which I, I play um, enough golf to know that it's frustrating as hell because the ball is not moving <laughs> and you're supposed to hit it. It's it's one thing, you know, catching a football or hitting a baseball, but that ball's not moving and, and it still kind of controls you. But where is the, the, the vision and sport and and how is that um something that can help gamers improve their gaming well i think one of the things that that influenced me one of my doctors dr kirshner at uh, southern california every year and i believe he still does it every year he goes to spring training with the la dodgers and he makes million multi-million dollar decisions just based on eye tracking um, perception, depth perception, field field of vision. Um, I was a former uh, quarterback in high school, so no, that, all that peripheral vision. And, you know, that is very important as far as how you're focusing from far away to up close, uh, making sure that you're blinking right. You know, that all involves within, within gaming, just kind of like staring at a computer. But there's lots of aspects within um, vision using things like a Brock string. I mean, Amy, you could probably, you know, go into more of that as far as the sports vision side of that. Right. Gary, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, the, the biggest catch-all on that is, is vision is often overlooked. It's kind of the sense that we take for granted because it's the one that's there for most of us, right? Yeah, so, without a doubt. I, I mean, everything that you take in visually is what drives your motor skills. So the basic concept of if you're not taking things in clear, consistent, and equal between the eyes with the eye muscles, the focusing, the clarity, then your brain, it's like a computer. It slows everything down in processing, trying to make something right when it can't. 
So it, at the first level for someone like a gamer, it's are you bringing things in clearly, consistently? Are your eye muscles coordinating? You know, that's like ground level because if you're talking about fractions of a second on reaction time, well, guess what happens? Oh, things yeah. aren't clear and they're not consistent. You've got a delay and you've got a built-in issue that we have to kind of overcome. And then it, it comes down to, you know, why do you have fatigue? You know, how do you keep your eyes more flexible, your muscles, so you have less distraction and discomfort, not only throughout, you know, a match, but also with travel, with end of day, if you ever wake up in the morning and you feel like your eyes are tired, but you just woke up, there's a reason why that happens. You didn't get good recovery. What happened while you were sleeping? So there's so many things involving um, your visual comfort, your perception, visualization, all different kinds of parts of vision therapy and sports therapy that can help athletes and gamers. Um, but it really comes down to the basics as far as clarity, comfort, consistency, and, and getting good, good rest. I, mean, I don't know that, you know, too many people understand that there's one that field that you, you know, you just covered, but from my own experience, I think your vision is your vision, right? And, I, it, and, and you see what you see and you correct it, but that there aren't exercises or training or surgical intervention or whatever it is that can improve those skills. So are there lots of or any um, codified exercises for athletes or even non-athletes, but for the sake of our purpose today, athletes that can improve um, their their visual perception, um, you know, their the clarity, um, and and even long term health in terms of less eye fatigue, so that you stay focused and and more depth of field perception. Uh, because I, I get to, I've never been presented with any exercises ever. Um, and having seen uh, eye doctor since, God, I, I forever, no one's ever really brought up, hey, do these five things. And you may or may not see a perceptible difference. So what are those exercises that people can do? Um, or even more importantly, where do you find out what they are? Other than, right. go, other than going to your practice, uh, and we won't show right. the practice for, 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 for the next three minutes. But other than that, where can people go um, to even learn what is available for them to improve all those areas that you referenced? Well, let's keep it, you know, to keep it, keep it simple. I, I think that because um, it's a, a whole field in and of itself. Um, but I think number one for understanding some resources on vision therapy and kind of how to, you know, uh, interest that you have in learning more. I think the American Optometric Association has a fantastic website, it's great resources to learn more. Um, visiting your local optometrist and asking those questions. If they don't have answers, they'll know colleagues who do. So that's the other other place. But let's talk about what you can do today and, and why it's important. Um, there is something called the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And it's a really easy tool to remember, and it's really important, and here's why. So if you think of what you do in front of a screen, if you're at work, if you're remote working, if you're a gamer, if you're you know, whatever it is that you're doing, when you're on a screen, your eye muscles have to turn in with each other, and they have to converge, and it's work. It's like taking your muscles to the gym, working the same muscle group for hours on end on a micro level. Yeah. And when someone feels eye strain, the researchers have told us that that's the equivalent of walking 50 miles. So think about that. Wow. If you tried to walk 50 miles, you'd be tired, right? So your eye muscles are under not happening in my life. I just want you to know that I, 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 I stopped for a donut after driving 25 miles. So uh, I'm the wrong example for that. But I appreciate I get that. It's exhausting and tiring, It is, which is why I don't do so, it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's crazy. And I think if you just look 20 feet away and let the muscles relax and go back to neutral, and you do that regularly, it just lets that flexibility stay in and that helps prevent that strain. So it's a way to give those muscles a little quick break. And then Tom, blink rate's an important too. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a number of things that I tell my own patients, you know, when I see them, sort of like the gym analogy, I'm like, you know, 
if you're sitting or staring in front of a computer for, for eight hours, try doing bench press in a gym for eight hours and see how you feel. It's not going to happen. A lot of complaints that I get from patients, you know, or whether it be from when you wake up in the morning, well, I can't see right. So what I tell patients to do is if you go in the kitchen, you're grabbing your orange juice or coffee, whatever it may be, look to the look far away to the corners of the room. Look at the TV 10, 20 feet away. Look at another corner. Then look up close at your phone and go back and forth. Just think of like a zoom in, zoom out camera that that gets stuck. You've got to create that visual flux, fluctuation with distances in order to sort of give your eyes a jumping jack. So that's how, how I kind of put it to my to my patients. Those are just simple things to do, making sure that you're blinking, because when you blink, all the oils around your eye, the oil needs to get there to lubricate. So when you strongly blink like I'm doing now, basically those oils are getting on your eyes, whether you're wearing contacts like I am or just naturally that oil is there. You know, from an esports or let's say a gaming perspective, again, it's it's creating that varied focus. Tracking becomes an important situation when you're in a you know a fighting game or whatever game that might be or Candy Crush. So the tracking of your eyes and just working on those skills, you know, back and forth tracking. And there's actually instruments within vision therapy that can actually track your eye muscles to see whether your eye muscles are on track. And are there exercises, I mean, it's like atrophy, right? If you don't work out or, you know, you work out a lot and then you get the flu and then you don't work out for a a week, you you feel like you're starting at zero again, right? So that atrophy is pretty damn quick, um, which is either a motivation or for some people go, well, what's the point, right? Because you lose it so quickly. Is that the same with your eye if you're really not doing some of these things that you just continue to atrophy um, not only your muscles but the entire movement of of your eyes of what you want them to be doing i would say that's less of an issue for eye movement since most of us do have glitches in our movements it's a pretty common human thing for us to not be perfect on our coordination but there's ways to fine tune it and that does take some expertise with your optometrist to figure out which exercises are more appropriate for you because it depends on how your eye muscles are working that we would want to fine tune and and give exercises that are more specific to to each individual patient. But I'll tell you where atrophy is huge. Um, We're finding out that when we're staring in front of screens, we blink like 60% less. And when we do blink, it's weak. And so what's happening is we're not blinking strong enough and often enough to actually stimulate the oil glands to work effectively. And that oil is a a critical part of the tear layer and your whole eye surface. So they're finding nine-year-old kids with atrophied oil glands as if they were a postmenopausal woman, which is a huge issue for dry eye. So if you think about a gamer... If they aren't blinking often on a regular basis, they're not blinking strong enough, then they are down regulating their oil gland issues. And so, it be, and that affects clarity in the moment. Yeah. So if, it's like a bad windshield. You know, you don't have good wipers. You don't have a good windshield. You're going to have blur. You're going to have inconsistency. And that slows you down and affects you whether you're aware of it or not. Yeah. Um, and so you want to have that great surface, great tear layer, good windshield, but also protect eye health over the long term and not damage those oil glands over time by not blinking frequently. So yeah, I was going to ask you if if you don't do that and obviously um screen time is is being um used by more and more younger kids as because of computer screen covid whatever you want the screen time just keeps in, increasing. I some of that that does it get so degraded that it can't be rehabilitated or is it naturally such if you start fo- focusing, forget the pun, um, that you can rehabilitate that which is not working to the extent that it should? Well, we won't know. Okay. We won't know for a while because dry eye is a, is a problem. And for those patients that have severe damage to their glands, it depends on are you getting to the point of scarring? Scarring isn't something that you're going to be able to walk yourself back from, right? That's pretty extreme. That's more autoimmune conditions and things like that later in life. Our bigger concern is will gland atrophy 
lead to problems when you hit your 30s, when you hit your 40s? You know, will eye drops that lubricate be enough? Will uh, treatments and surgical interventions be enough to restore comfort? And will it be an expensive proposition for Let's say a gamer is, is you know, now hitting their 30s. Are they going to need a treatment every month that costs $1,500 a month to get their oil glands to start working? Well, you know, there'll be an answer, but is it a reasonable and an accessible answer for people? So the prevention is always the best, you know, route rather than let's see what we can do later if there's issues. So using eye drops that are designed for the eye surface, like at night, morning, midday, you know, every few hours putting a good drop of lubrication in is, is really important to replenish the eye surface and the oils um, and also you know warm compress you know trying to stimulate the the oil glands even when you're in the shower you close your eyes and, and let that hot water warm water kind of roll over your eyelids and then massage this way and then in a circle a few times that can naturally stimulate your own oils to keep them working so there are some really easy things that you can do that don't cost a dime yeah. and are just part of your routine that can be preventive which is really which is effective. fascinating. I mean, because in all the years that I've been involved in gaming and, and, and esports, no one has talked about any of these things, which is fascinating to me. You know, there there's a whole um, category now of uh, hydration and dehydration uh, physically. Does somebody's level of dehydration also impact their eyes or the reduction of electrolytes in their body in negatively impacting not only their their, their eyes from a visual a visual perspective but from a, por- a performance perspective oh absolutely i mean when you're dealing with hydration aspects um <clears throat> which can affect the brain and the eye brain relationship is is important it's you know very similar to you know an electrical you know, impulse. So if you're dehydrated, then that can affect your overall visual aspect. You can see, you know, spots or starbursts or whatever, whatever it might be, you know, that could affect you while you're driving. That can affect you while your performance in a sport, esports, playing games on the computer, you know, all of the above. So that's where also nutrition plays a part, you know, and hydration and, and doing the right things, reducing, you know, sodium content, those types of things. Obviously, help things like omega-3 whether it be in supplements or i prefer getting things from the real foods like eating you know fish and salmon and those types of things all those things play an important role absolutely because you know yeah skins um is releasing an electrolyte product shortly uh but what's interesting is we talk with our scientific team nobody actually has ever correlated which is why i asked um the dehydration and the depletion of electrolytes being magnesium, potassium, sodium, chloride, and all the other things that go into that. Uh, nobody ever has mentioned the correlation in even remotely as to vision. It, it's always about muscle cramps, attention, focus, tiredness, brain fog, and things like that, but, but never vision. And when you think about all your senses, you know, vision is pretty Darn important. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to why it's been like not addressed. And when I talk to esports teams, uh, you know, they have nutritionists. Great. They've got performance coaches. Great. But you don't really hear them having uh, visual experts. And are you experiencing uh, teams going, oh, wow, I never we never thought about that. We never looked at the correlation between the subject matter that we're talking about and actually improving the roster. I mean, what's your experience to date? Um, and then I'll ask you probably even a, a more basic question is, why do you care about esports and gaming? Answer that first, then we'll get into the response from the, from, you know, from, from uh, all the esports teams, because that's kind of backwards if I do it the other way. <laughs> No, I I mean, I I think that, you know, for us, it's a natural fit and you're alluding to that. I mean, where we can make the most impact with our knowledge and and our expertise. I mean, I've been in practice, you know, Tom as well for 22 years and I've seen 80,000 80,000 people, you know, I'm not motivated by keeping that to myself in a four, in a four, you know, (laughs) wall room. You want to be able to make an impact with when you can help people. That's what drives me as a person is how can I help more people and the people I can probably help the most with the, with the experiences that we've had over two decades is gaming. 
you know, players are the, are the people who can benefit most visually um, and nutritionally and everything that Tom had mentioned. So for us, you know, esports is a place where um, there's advantage in having, you know, good nutrition and visual skills and visualization. It matters. And I think it's also about enjoying the experience. It's not always about competitive play. It's just about, you know, you want to feel good with whatever you're doing. Why, why you should be able to enjoy playing, you know, playing and not have eye discomfort and visual discomfort. You should enjoy the experience, whether it's competitive or it's, it's casual and just fun hanging out with your well, friends. When you look so at the, that's the, important. When you look at the 3 billion people that do game um, on a global basis every day, a very small percentage of that is actually eSports. I mean, the bulk yeah. of the market are casual gamers wanting to play with their friends or their family. Sure. So, and and they, they watch a lot of YouTube and what have you to get better at it, uh, which means you know, their screen time's up and everything else, um, it's, it's escalated. But most of that is just people wanting to game. And if you look at the average age of a gamer being 37 um, and almost 50-50 male, female, and seems to be creeping up as opposed to creeping down. And you look at the... Uh, the, the medical community saying the older you are, the more you game, the better it is for your mental acuity and, and, mm -hmm. and stopping dementia and Alzheimer's and everything else. You would think, and this is kind of shocking to me as I sit here today to hear all the things that, that I am pleased to hear from you, is that this is like, you know, a, a missing piece in overall health and vision is just so critically important to everything we do. And I'm, I'm really surprised that I don't hear more about it from my own guests on the podcast. And this is a health and wellness lens podcast um, to PSAs from the gaming companies or um, the accessories companies, or you just, you just don't hear it. It seems to be one, uh, a massive opportunity, which I'm sure it's one of the reasons you're in this space, but from a personal health perspective, it's critical. And I don't even think that there's like a short ebook about the top 10 eye exercises that you could be doing on a daily basis, weekly basis to improve that. Yeah. And that. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I think um, looking at our own careers, it's, it's interesting. You know, you see so many patients, 85% of what we learn is through the eyes. Now you think of your own um, journey through school, kindergarten, first grade. You have to present at elementary school your dental records and make sure that you have a dental exam, but not a complete eye exam. What is now? I'm, I'm not, you know, downgrading our teeth. But what's more important in school? Your eyes in order to learn math and English and social studies and everything else, or you know, or your teeth. Then not downgrading that, but. This comes full circle with us and our own daughter, who's uh, 12 now, and a couple of years back before uh, COVID, she's playing a lot of games and a lot of Fortnite, and we're sort of like, okay, we got to tone down the screen time and all that. Then COVID hits, and it was a, a big eye-opening experience for us because socially, mentally, um, Psychology-wise, that is where she went to play. That was her yeah. social outlook. And then at the same time, my good friend from college when I went to Arizona State, um, Doug Kennedy, he's been gaming for 25 years, him and his wife. So when you hear things like Guitar Hero Rock Band, he created those, those, um, those games. And he came to us and sort of saw that we were getting involved in, in more health and outside the exam room and said to us, you know, I want to make my gamers more healthy. Like what, what can we do together that can get this Cheetos down in the basement, you know, drink in the Mountain Dew scenario um, out of the way. And then that's where Amy and I said, you know what, let's look at our own house at our child and what we can do is support. And then he went through everything, all the opportunities for, for gaming, for careers. And it just opened up our eyes and said, we do have a spot. I, I health does have a spot within gaming and esports, and we need to start talking about it. Yeah, without a doubt. Have you found the industry receptive? And when I say receptive, not just saying, oh, yeah, that's important. We're interested 
and then they go get a Red Bull, right? Because, you know, Skins was founded and is still founded on the belief of health and wellness. You can achieve all the things you want, but you can achieve it in, 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 a, in a way that's better for you and better for your community. But what has been the response from the esports community uh, to the information? Well, Chicago. I mean, you want to talk about Chicago, Amy? That was yes. I I was in the um, esports trade association um, meeting and pitch competition in in Chicago, and you know, Tom and I are involved in product development around health and wellness, specifically to help benefit players in a, in a lot of different ways. And one of the areas of of interest and uh, personal passion is around circadian rhythm and sleep making sure that when you're focusing, how can you do that in a healthy way? It's not just while you're gaming. It's also what happens afterwards. Mental and physical health is really important. And there are things that we can do to make that better. So the reception in Chicago and the reception in the industry, you know, uh, broadly has been fantastic. Like, we need this. You know, we need this information. We need products like this. Um, this is something that we don't see, just as you have have said, Gary. Um, nobody's really talking about this, but we really need to and should. So when we talk to players and, and coaches, and Tom does that a lot, they, all of them are very um, welcoming. They want to give input and feedback and talk to us about the things that are affecting them. And that's how we got started with Doug and, and his wife, Tracy. You know, we kind of sat down together and said, we want to hear from players we want to talk to gamers and find out what is what do they really need? Where are their their pain points? What what are they struggling with? What are they not finding in the Red Bulls and in the marketplace? And we went straight to the grassroots with them and asked them those very questions. And it was amazing when we did a survey with them through through Tracy's company Reverb. I mean, they went to town like four or five pages of this written information that just talked about what's wrong with this concept and perception of energy drinks being what we want when really that doesn't serve us. So quit feeding us stuff that's all hyped up on caffeine and has all this junk and preservatives and chemicals. You know, these are the things that really matter to us. A lot of people have the perception that gamers don't care about health, but when you actually talk to gamers, they do. I mean, they're like you, me, and everyone else. I mean, we're, we're all people in our, in you know, average age is, is in your 30s. Um, you know, health is important. So it, you don't have to, to use junk. You can actually have healthy products and, and care about health, and, and the, that's no different in gaming. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it's interesting because uh, dealing with gamers and teams and, and arenas and facilities – they, they they all say yes they they care about it and and then there just seems to be this gap about actually living it and and I'm sure it takes time to you know change habits and I know there's lots of studies of what it takes to change a habit and break a habit and what have you um, what 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 fascinates me and I'm, I'm happy to see it is the conversation is certainly front and center and and that you have to have before you have implementation um, and, and it is it, it is critically important. I've got two in, in the interest of time. I've got a, about two other questions and then I'm going to let you deal with uh, all the things that you deal with. Does screen size matter? I mean, because you have more people mobile gaming now than they are on a computer or console or wherever it is. It, is there a difference in um, the impact visually on screen size or is it distance to screen? I know nothing about this. I'm just thinking logically it's one it's got to either be distance of screen, size of screen, um and and maybe age and what are those factors that positively or or negatively impact um vision and, and acuity um in in any individual players and otherwise. Also, I'll let you take that Amy, but also lighting plays a major effect as, as mm-hmm. well. lighting affects your pupil size when you're in dark light, obviously your pupils open up. When you're in bright light, they shrink. And when they shrink, you have more concentration back to your, your macular area, which is your central vision, like a laser beam. Um, so that's another factor. Yeah. Well, every agey person in a restaurant knows that, uh, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll hear them just order the special so they don't have to read the menu. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, exactly. the lighting without a doubt. But, but Amy, where, where is that, the, 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 the correlation between distance, size of screen and time? I mean, is that, are those the factors? Those are the factors, but it, again, it comes down to the individual because every individual has a clarity um, 
let's say that you're nearsighted and your natural focal uh, focus of your eyes happens to be at two feet. Well, then the optimal place for you to place that screen is going to be right where your eye muscles and your focusing system are at rest. So it's not a standard to say, well, you have to have something at exactly 18 inches or at exactly 22 inches, because what's good for you is going to be dependent on clarity and also your eye muscles. Wow. This is where, you know, it, it really does matter because if you just say everyone needs the same size and everyone needs the same distance, you're assuming that everybody's eye muscles muscles and ability to bend light is exactly the same. And we're all unique people. Yep. So that's what we, that's kind of the, the, the nitty gritty that we love to get into is figuring that out. Obviously, if you have something too small and too close to you, it's more work for you. So a general principle is that if it's a little further away and larger, it's less stress and strain on your eyes. You know, it's so interesting because be nobody, nobody's ever talked about that, you know, in terms of the individuality of your eyes and what it is you're doing. You know, when you were saying that, I was thinking I, I recently got fitted for golf clubs and I should not be playing the same length shaft as my six foot two friends. It doesn't make any sense from the apex of our swing. And it absolutely made a difference once I got measured for it. And and it's fascinating. I didn't think about that for God knows how many years that I was playing golf and giving up way too much money because the apex of my swing should have been some someplace completely else. And now the Arbor Society comes after me a little bit less, um, <laughs> a little bit less. But it's it's it, it'd be great if there was some test that a gamer could understand where that length should be, even as a place to start with, right? To say I should be eighteen inches or twelve, whatever that happens to be, um, which would be a great thing to develop if that's what you're inclined to do. So in the the the, the last seconds that we have or minutes. If there were four exercises that you would recommend for gamers to do on somewhat of a regular basis to help them um, improve not only their gaming, but less tired eyes and what have you, what would you suggest they do? Go ahead, Amy. I'll let you go. So I think number one, I would use artificial tears that you get over the counter. Okay. Lubricant drops a drop each eye night morning midday when you take a break and grab something to eat replenish your eye surface i think that's just like using lotion on your skin you'd never neglect your skin and not use lotion and let it get dry and cracked we shouldn't do that with the eye surface as well so that's one easy thing that you can do second thing would be the 20 20 20 rule every 20 minutes look 20 feet away for 20 seconds i think third would be you know, put that screen out at about 22 inches, sit ergonomically in your chair where you're resting and comfortable and kind of see where it takes to where you have less strain, more clarity and take a moment to assess kind of where you are positioned because it's not just the screen. It's also where you are in a chair too. And make sure that you're comfortable in your chair where you're sitting where you need to be and then move that screen back and forth up and down just a tiny little bit, very slight movements and see where you're feeling less strain, more clarity visit your optometrist can help you do that with a little more expertise, obviously, and, and measure appropriately. And then I think the most important thing is you've got to sleep. Really um, make sure that you're using some blue light protection if you're on screens after about 6 p.m. so that you don't disrupt your natural sleep-wake cycle or your circadian rhythm. You know, one of the cool things we forget is it takes the body about four hours to produce melatonin. So if you are going to bed at midnight and you think you're going to sleep, but you didn't have blue light protection, your body's not going to sleep till four o'clock in the morning. So to make sure you're getting adequate sleep, you do need to protect your eyes from blue light in the evening and make sure that you're getting adequate rest. So your body can recover, eye muscles included. Super important for overall health. Great advice. Uh, you have an, an open platform here to talk about anything as you develop it. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the time. Uh, and keep doing what you're doing. Uh, the, the world is open for visual acuity for gamers and otherwise. And, and I know as somebody in gaming, appreciate all your effort and everything else you're doing. And thank you for the time to spend with Power Your Performance. Yeah, thank we, you so much, Gary. Yeah, My we pleasure. really appreciate the time. And, uh, and we'll talk you know, soon. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the MAP 
Esports Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Please be sure to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast player.